compact, the most deadly ship of war, tongue for tongue, ever conceived by man as the submarine. No training is more rigid, no training more intense than that of the submariner, who must fight his battles imprisoned in a carcass of steel, sailing in the deeps of the world's water basins. in the pressure chamber. Difficult practice with the moms and lung for escaping from wrecked submarines. Rigorous tests these sailors must pass to become full-fledged submariners. 50% of the volunteers will fail. New fleet submarines are built for long-range patrols lasting up to 75 days built to cruise 10,000 miles without refueling. When commissioned, they will be named for Fish, Tullyby and Tang, Growler and Gudgeon, Sea Raven and Skate. On the New England coast, the killer fish are spawned that will eat at the vitals of Japan. the equivalent of 1,000 pounds of TNT. With bold and skillful torpedo tactics, a single submarine can kill an enemy aircraft carrier, as the Albacore did in the Central Pacific. A perfect torpedo spread will sink the biggest battleship, as Sea Lion II did in the East China Sea. These are targets every skipper dreams of. But there is another, less spectacular, more important target, the Japanese Merchant Marine. and 75 men in each new submarine learn to live with their boat and with each other, conditioning themselves for the tests and trials that are yet to come. The voyage is long, but with every passing watch, the fledgling submarine becomes a more efficient weapon, a happier boat with a character all her own. adventure, ordeal in obscurity, will be her lot. The submarine service is the silent service. The Atlantic gives way to the Caribbean, the Caribbean to the Panama Canal connecting the east with the west and the west with the east more valuable to the united states than all her gold the defense of a hemisphere rests on control of this tiny strip of water
warships like the Iowa, carriers like the Essex, cruisers like the Baltimore, destroyers like the Fletcher squeeze through the locks, while electric mules haul and real monkeys play. Submarines, too, cross the 40-mile Central American Isthmus to join those who have gone before, those who have gone to war. sundown lies Pearl Harbor. The boat tautens, the crew sharpens. Drill and practice, practice and drill, and more drill and more practice, and now submerging practice. Sixty seconds to make a 300-foot boat, racing over the water at 20 knots, vanish completely. submarines that arrive at the rate of four and five a month. Fresh new crews, clean new boats are welcomed by the veterans into the camaraderie of arms. An emotion of men welded together in a common experience with a common purpose. experience in submarine warfare. He remembers that underwater boats almost brought England to her knees in World War I. He has seen the havoc wrought by U-boats in the Battle of the Atlantic in World War II. If the Axis can do it, 
so can the Allies. From his headquarters in Pearl Harbor, the Admiral directs a powerful, coordinated force of Allied wolf packs and single submarines, ranging from the Aleutians to the East Indies, from the societies to the Koreans. All over, everywhere, underwater sailors execute the first commandment of United States submarine doctrine. Inflict maximum damage on enemy ships and shipping by offensive patrol at focal points. In from the submarines at sea pour the results. From Rasher, 100,000 tons, sunk. From Barb, 97,000 tons, sunk. From Tang, 94,000 tons, sunk. From Silver Sides, 90,000 tons, sunk. Gradual but incessant puncturing of the arteries, all over, everywhere, through which flows the life of the Japanese Empire. And ordered out from headquarters, go more submarines into war against the Empire of Japan. Clary's Crushers, Roach's Raiders, Blair's Blasters. Preparing for the first patrol, submarine and crew face a grim gamut of missions. All hazardous, all alone, all far from base. They may be ordered to mine enemy coastal waters. They may be ordered to photograph island shorelines for invasion. They may be ordered to rescue downed pilots at sea. They may be ordered to smuggle spies into Japanese territory. They may be ordered on missions from which there is no return. Orders. Many orders will be issued, and all will receive the same simple response. Aye, aye, sir. But no matter what the mission, the threat of death at full fathom fire, of death in the depths, hovers over the submariners. And yet they put to sea with one thought only follow the motto of their sister ship, Gudgeon. The motto that says, find them, chase them, sink them. Japanese shipping is the immediate target of the Allied submarine offensive. The most modern, the most dynamic society in the East is an island society. And the Achilles heel of an island empire, the heartbeat of an industrial nation, is its means of transport over the seas. Destroy that means. Destroy the merchant marine. Destroy the navy. And the skill and diligence of the 27 million Japanese who support the war will be valueless. Every shop, every factory, Every industry will be idle, bankrupt. The greatest industrial cities of the East, Tokyo, Yokohama, Nagasaki, Kobe, Japan's foundries, steel mills, heavy industry make war possible. But torpedoes at sea will dampen the fires. Battleships for the fleet, guns for the army, bombs for the planes. Without the ore, the coal, the raw material shipped in from overseas. The furnaces will grow cold. The machinery will stop. Destroy Japan's ability to produce. That is what the submarines will do. Merely to exist in peacetime, Japan needs three million tons of shipping. The third largest merchant fleet in the world. For war. The tonnage must be doubled. To link the home islands with the essential resources of our empire. To maintain our garrisons overseas. To weld together the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. Japan needs ships. Ships and ships and more ships. Adrenaline that 
keeps Japan alive flows in through her ports, across her docks and onto her wharves. The Japanese have conquered an empire stretching from Siberia to the Indies. But none of the victories won on the battlefield, won at sea, will profit Japan if the grubby routine of the waterfront is disrupted. play for the vital Marus, the merchant ships. But sailing south, east, west, and north, they keep the island empire alive. Without her men of war, Japan cannot conquer. Without her merchantmen, she cannot survive. From the Asiatic mainland, from Malaya and Indochina, from the Philippines and Borneo, the plunder pours in that feeds the Japanese war machine, feeds Japan. Oil, rice, sugar, salt, the stuff of life itself. the shore or far at sea, the freighters, the transports. Destruction of the Japanese merchant fleet becomes a major objective of the Allied war at sea. Top priority targets, the freighters, the transports.
Japanese destroyers, quick on the draw, counterattack, hurling ton upon ton of high explosives down into the darkness of the ocean deeps, where the submarine tries to hide. Once sonar detects the submarine, the depth charges are scattered in a pattern, blanketing the entire area. The attack may last hours, and few ordeals in war are more grueling, more agonizing, more horrible. It is a time for stout hulls and stouter hearts. submarine survives. Back into action. Back to the attack. Sink them all. ship, tonnage, cargo, Japanese survivors tell of the mounting toll of their disaster. 1,392 ships sunk by submarines. Six million tons, tankers whose gasoline never reached the warplanes, boilers whose fuel never reached the warships, transports whose troops never reached the front, colliers whose product never reached the furnaces, freighters whose ore and wealth never reached the war machine. The submarines have sunk the Japanese Empire. Course 090, back to Pearl. 52 submarines will never return. Their epitaph, overdue, presumed lost. But for those who return, those who survive, those whose contribution to victory is second to none. Their citation, well done.